I'm curious, which is an advantage in my profession because I'm a scientist. However, if you were to ask me what kind of scientist, I would actually struggle to answer you. That's because I'm an interfacial scientist, one of a growing number of academics who perform their research at the interface of disciplines. In my instance, my background was in biochemistry, but I moved to a chemistry lab to do my PhD research. My next position was in a physics lab where I studied、uh, structural biology, and now I'm a group leader at the Leiden University Medical Centre where I investigate the human immune system. This background was not driven by any kind of plan, academic or otherwise. Instead, I followed my curiosity. This does kind of mean that I don't know everything about anything. But it also means that I know about varied fields of research. This background has left me with an unusual mix of knowledge, and this allows me to build bridges between fields of science and approach scientific problems from unusual or unexpected directions. This is a huge advantage because science is one of the most creative disciplines that one can follow. By its very nature, science is at the forefront of human knowledge, and scientists are investigating things that have never before been investigated. This also obviously means thinking of things that have never been thought of before, and this jump into the unknown requires a burst of inspiration and creativity. Being able to make connections between seemingly disparate fields of research therefore facilitates such a creative approach. I'm going to tell you today about how work in my lab is using such a multidisciplinary approach to try and understand how part of our immune system is activated. To do this, I'll be borrowing ideas from immunology. Synthetic biology, chemistry, and microscopy. This approach was recognised as an innovative idea by the EU, and last year the European Research Council awarded me one and a half million euros to start my own research group. Thank you. The human immune system comprises two branches: the innate and the adaptive. Our innate immune system comprises Permanent things that our body has that try and quickly stop infection by pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. This includes things like our skin and stomach acid, and we also have cells and proteins that roll around inside us and try and attack anything seen as foreign or non-self. In contrast, our adaptive immune system, as the name suggests, can adapt and evolve over the period of our lifetime to tackle new problems such as infection by a brand new kind of virus. This is all mediated by antibodies and is the basis of vaccination, by far the most important advancement in human medicine. Bridging these two branches is the complement system, so named because it complements the two. Complement comprises around 30 proteins present in our blood and tissues, many of which circulate in an inactive form. Complement can be activated when antibodies bind to the surfaces of cells and they form a platform. This platform acts like a landing pad for the first protein of complement, which binds and then somehow becomes activated. And we want to understand this process of activation, because complement proteins attack and destroy targeted cells. And understanding this may lead to new ways of treating infections and diseases such as cancer, which I'll talk about later. However, at the moment, we don't yet understand this process of activation. And one of the reasons we don't is because it is very difficult to study individual proteins. Proteins are the workhorses of our bodies. In us, they perform almost all of the mechanical, structural, and chemical work of our bodies. They're made up of sequential amino acids, just like beads on a string, and it's simply the order of these amino acids which dictates the structure and the function of each protein. For example, one sequence of amino acids. Will always fold to form hemoglobin, which carries oxygen around our bodies and is the reason our blood is red. Another sequence of amino acids will always fold to form rhodopsin, which is found in our eyes and allows us to see. Although there are only 20 common amino acids, predicting a protein's structure and function just from its sequence of amino acids is incredibly difficult. This is one of the biggest unsolved questions in biology and is known as the protein folding problem. It's actually something I worked on during my PhD. Proteins fold reliably into complex 3D shapes in a bottom-up process called self-assembly, and this is different to the top-down processes we're all much more familiar with. Things like sawing, sanding, and gluing the chairs you're sitting on, or microfabricating the chips within your smartphone. 
These all require manufacturing and outside influence. However, all of you are here because of self-assembly. When you were conceived, your cells and their contents self-assembled and self-organized on their own to form human embryos that then grew and divided again and again to form adult humans. No fabrication or manufacturing step was ever required. And this is what proteins do. All of the information dictating a protein's structure and function is encoded within the sequence of amino acids of the protein itself. This would be much like taking all of the components required to build a computer, just throwing them together and letting the computer build itself. And it is this process of self-assembly that is incredibly difficult to understand and predict, hence the protein folding problem. So what my lab is doing is bypassing this big problem and instead using a material that we do understand. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is the recipe book for our bodies. In us, it contains all of the information in the format of a genetic code required to program a human body. But we can also use DNA as a nanoscale building material. This is possible because, unlike proteins, we do understand how DNA self-assembles. This is thanks to work by physicists over the past couple of decades who have uncovered many of the rules governing how DNA folds. Nowadays, all we have to do is design the shape we want, mix together the correct DNA strands, and the desired construct will spontaneously form. We can make this DNA cheaply in the lab for only around the price of a pack of aspirin. We can also ensure that it contains no genetic code. It is therefore biologically inert and safe. It is just a building material. The ability to program strands of DNA to self-assemble into complex 3D architectures is essential because these kind of molecules are far too small to be manufactured using any kind of manual process. This tetrahedron in the corner is only around 30 nanometers across. That's about 5,000 times thinner than a human hair. To give you a sense of scale, if my thumb, if the tetrahedron was the size of my thumb, then one of my hairs would be about five times as wide as this lecture theater and long enough to reach the edge of space, 100 kilometers up. What we're now doing is making tiny DNA constructs that can bind to proteins and guide them to adopt specific shapes. We're therefore reducing the protein folding problem by using the DNA as a kind of template or scaffold. And the reason we're doing this is because we already know that antibodies have to form this platform to activate our immune system. And we also know that the size and shape of this platform is critical for immune system activation. With DNA, we can easily change the size and the shape of this antibody, antibody landing pad without having to understand the much more complex folding rules of the antibodies themselves. We want to look at exactly how this DNA is affecting these antibodies and activating our immune system. However, proteins are very small, and the protein that activates the complement system is only around 20 nanometers across. That's even smaller than the DNA I was talking about earlier. To see such tiny molecules, we use a technique called electron microscopy. Electron microscopes are very similar in concept to the light microscopes we're all more familiar with from school, except they are very large and very expensive. This one cost around six million euros. But the reason we use electrons is because we can give them enough energy to see the actual atoms and individual protein molecules themselves. What you can see here is a kind of cell shown in grey, and the complement system has literally punched a hole in the top of it. I was able to take this information and reconstruct the 3D shape of this pore to understand how complement is killing cells. However, giving electrons so much energy also means that they damage the sample. To limit this damage, we cool everything down to minus 180 degrees Celsius, which we do with liquid nitrogen. And this gives the technique its name, cryogenic electron microscopy, or cryo-EM. The pioneers in the field of cryo-EM won the Nobel Prize in chemistry last year. And we are fortunate enough to have in Leiden two of the world's most advanced microscopes in the world that we're going to use to look at our DNA protein complexes. And the reason we're doing all of this is because we want to understand how to activate our immune system. Because when we understand it, we can exploit it. I've already said that our own immune system doesn't attack our own cells. This is good. We don't want our immune system attacking our bodies. However, cancer is a disease of our own cells. Tumors are caused when our cells divide 
uncontrollably when and where they shouldn't. Using these DNA templates or scaffolds, we're hoping to target specific cancer cell types to force our immune system to destroy them. In contrast to chemotherapy, all we'll have to do is add DNA, a natural substance, and our immune system will take care of the rest. This should offer a simple and cheap and effective treatment for cancer. Following my curiosity has led me to come up with this research idea, and it's led me to some exceptional labs in both the UK and the Netherlands, where I've met some really interesting people and learned a lot about how scientists from different disciplines approach scientific problems. And I've learned that if you know everything about something, it means you're at the forefront of your field. However, if you know a lot about a few things, it means you can create your own field. So I would say it doesn't matter if you're a scientist or an artist, or a politician or an architect. We should all follow our curiosity. We should all learn as much as possible about as many things as possible, because you never know what creative connections you'll be able to make. Thank you.